Take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> CannabisRadio.com presents The Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hey, this is great, man. We love it. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. All right, good day, tokers and tokettes, and welcome to the show. It is Wednesday, December 9th, 2015, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Let me open up with an apology for missing you all yesterday. You know, I try and I try to do a show every weekday, and uh, usually I can pull it off, but yesterday I just could not. We are approaching the uh, Christmas break, and the folks at HighTimes.com, they have a big Christmas vacation coming up, which means I have to get all my Radical Rant articles written in advance for the rest of this month, so it's taking a lot of my time to get that done. And then to add to that, uh, I'm continuing on my project to uh, hyperlink all of the legalization initiatives, only to find out that uh, the Sean Parker Initiative, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act in California, has undergone some pretty major amendments. So now I have to relink up uh, all of that in their new version and uh, all the others in Nevada, Massachusetts, Maine, and Arizona. So we'll be working on that, publishing a whole lot of stuff. Follow me at Radical Russ to get the latest updates whenever I get something published. And uh, we'll have all the information you need to make an informed decision on Election Day. All right, coming up on today's show, speaking of informed decisions, we're going to get our Hemp Day Hump Day update from Doug Fine. He's at Organic Cowboy on Twitter, and of course, he is the best-selling author of Hemp Bound and Too High to Fail, among other books. He has recently been attending some of the committee meetings, uh, setting the rules for hemp industries here in the state of Oregon. He's going to join us at half past to give us an update on what's happening, what the hemp industry will look like going forward forward. Then after that on the show today, at the end of the show, we'll have time to get into a radical rant. And uh, I'm going to point out how Kevin Sabet doesn't have a calling. He has a bigotry. There's a great uh, article by Joel Warner up at International Business Times. And I mean great in the sense of painting the picture, not necessarily what picture is being painted. But uh, it's all about Kevin Sabet. And it laments that uh, he's the only he's really the only celebrity fighting uh, for marijuana to be illegal to continue prohibition. I shouldn't say celebrity, I meant public policy figure, but, you know, well-known public policy figure fighting for marijuana to be completely illegal. So I've written up a rebuttal to that piece. Uh, We'll go through that today on the Radical Rant, and it'll appear online on hightimes.com on Friday. Also coming up on the show today, we'll have time to get into the drug war data mines. We're going to look at the treatment episode data set and what it tells us about big rehab and why they are fighting so much to keep marijuana illegal or at least punished in some way. Before that, we'll have time to get behind the headlines and we'll look at the idiocy of setting possession limits that are grossly out of step with what cultivation uh, can produce for home growers, whether they be medical marijuana or recreational growers. Today, we look at a case in Michigan where a couple are facing four years worth of felony time based on whether or not they had too much usable marijuana. But given how many plants they're allowed to grow, how could they not have had too much usable marijuana? But before all that, we start things off with the Cannabis Radio News. And in the headlines today, we've got the big news about the Sean Parker Initiative in California. We've got the University of Vermont offering a course on medical marijuana. Florida's Office of Compassionate Use is taking a look at state rules for their growers of high CBD strains. In the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we've got a proposal for marijuana decriminalization to take a look at. And once again, the religious use of marijuana loses in the U.S. court system. All that coming up right after this break, so stick around. This is the Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com. The 
son of a Polish immigrant who grew up in a Brooklyn tenement. He went to public schools, then college, where the work of his life began, fighting injustice and inequality, speaking truth to power. He moved to Vermont, won election and praise as one of America's best mayors. In Congress, he stood up for working families and for principle, opposing the Iraq war, supporting veterans. Now he's taking on Wall Street and a corrupt political system, funded by over a million contributions, tackling climate change to create clean energy jobs, fighting for living wages, equal pay, and tuition-free public colleges. People are sick and tired of establishment politics, and they want real change. Bernie Sanders, husband, father, grandfather, an honest leader, building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, and I approve this message. Gondrepreneur.com, your guide to the cannabis business world. Gondrepreneur.com is a comprehensive resource for cannabis professionals and entrepreneurs. Download the Gondrepreneur app on your smartphone or tablet to catch up on cannabis industry news, scroll through our daily job listings, and learn about successful cannabis companies, executives, and investors. Gondrepreneur.com, helping Gondrepreneurs grow. It's time for the Cannabis Radio News. Covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Cannabis Radio News is now available exclusively at CannabisRadio.com. Now your marijuana headlines in 4 minutes and 20 seconds. This is Cannabis Radio News. This is your Cannabis Radio News for Wednesday, December 9th, 2015. Yesterday, a majority of the board of directors for the Coalition for Cannabis Policy Reform, or CCPR, agreed to vote to withdraw its own measure, known as Reform California, to legalize marijuana in California. Six members of the CCPR board then immediately announced their endorsement of the recently amended statewide ballot measure known as the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, backed by Napster billionaire Sean Parker, to control and regulate and tax marijuana. They include Dr. David Bronner, or I'm sorry, David Bronner, the CEO of North America's top-selling brand of natural soaps, Nate Bradley, the executive director of the California Cannabis Industry Association, Stacia Costner, the deputy director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, Neil Franklin, the executive director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, Antonio Gonzalez, the president of the Latino Voters League and the William C. Velasquez Institute in Los Angeles, and Richard Lee, the founder of Oaksterdam University in Oakland. In addition, Dr. Larry Bedard, former president of the American College of Emergency Physicians, has agreed to withdraw as an official co-proponent of the Reform California measure and instead support the AUMA. As more states allow for the use of medical marijuana, the University of Vermont is offering a course in the science of the drug, and the professors say they are challenged by a lack of research on what has long been a taboo topic. Other institutions have offered classes in marijuana law and policy, but the university's medical school is likely the country's first to offer a full course on medical cannabis, according to the Association of American Medical Colleges and Universities. Other medical schools have touched on the topic. The Massachusetts Medical Society, an accredited institution, is offering online medical marijuana courses, including one on pharmacology, but it's also limited because of the lack of research on the topic. The Vermont course will cover cannabis taxonomy, medical chemistry of cannabinoids, the chemicals found in marijuana, the physiological effects of the drug, emerging therapeutic applications, and the historical, political, and socioeconomic influences on marijuana legislation. The growers that Florida's Office of Compassionate Use selected to dispense medical marijuana got their first look at state rules Wednesday, but instead of discussion between the growers and the state, there was mostly silence. Five growers around the state were officially selected to grow Florida's first form of medical marijuana in late November. The companies had until 5 p.m. Wednesday to post a $5 million performance bond. The Department of Health said four had posted the money by Wednesday afternoon. The draft rules include dispensing requirements, hygiene and odor control, and security. After looking at the rules, stakeholders in Florida's capital said there weren't many surprises. Growers and the state are still hoping that the medicine could be available by next summer. Pittsburgh City Councilor Daniel Lavelle has proposed legislation to decriminalize marijuana. Under the ordinance, possession would be punishable by a civil fine of up to $100 for less than 30 grams of marijuana or 8 grams of hashish. 
Lavelle was inspired to take a look at decriminalization when he was approached by the Bloomfield Garfield Corporation and the Alliance for Police Accountability, which had both been working on the issue. Supporters of the ordinance said it will reduce the number of youths funneled into the criminal justice system. Many individuals with a marijuana possession charge on their record are barred from economic opportunity. An estimated 1,000 individuals annually are charged with minor marijuana possession in Pittsburgh. But Lavelle's office says that most of the charges are reduced and end up resulting in a fine anyway. This ordinance would essentially cut out the middleman by directing police officers to issue a fine from the beginning. A federal judge on Monday dismissed a complaint filed by Ann Armstrong and Alan Gordon of the Healing Church, who said the government interfered with their, quote, cannabis-related religious activity, end quote, at the Roger Williams National Memorial in May. The complainants were told that the permit for their service, quote, does not grant permission to undertake any activity that may violate federal, state, or municipal laws or regulations, end quote, including the Controlled Substances Act. On May 16th, Armstrong and Gordon began to pray daily for the May 23rd service by using cannabis at the park's dry well. They were fined $100 each. In Monday's decision, the judge said the plaintiffs could have practiced their religion freely elsewhere. Their only arguments for the park was that the biblical reference to INRI refers to in Rhode Island and that the park symbolizes religious freedom. This has been your Cannabis Radio News for Wednesday, December 9th, 2015. I'm Russ Belville. Imagine life without taxes. Let New Era Certified Public Accountants, NewEraCPAs.com, handle your Cannabis 280E in tax strategy. Get your business prepared with New Era CPAs Cannabis Finance Boot Camp. NewEraCPAs.com, with years of experience in the industry, we are one of the nation's leading accounting firms for growers, dispensaries, and ancillary companies from Washington to California. NewEraCPAs.com. Marijuana is not addictive, but listening to the Russ Belleville Show is. Your connection to quality cannabis insurance services is spelled K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. That's Karcher Insurance. We have worked with ventures like cannabis for over 60 years. We're proud to represent over 50 companies with tailor-made cannabis business plans for owners just like you to insure your product, your plants, and your pursuits. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R spells out their full-service insurance services, ranging from commercial to bonds, to personal, from life to health, and more. Contact the team at karcherinsurance.com and let our experience work for you. That's K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R insurance.com. Contact Karen and the team at Karcher Insurance at 1-844-421-3560. That's 844-421-3560. Welcome back, everyone. Today in Behind the Headlines, we take a look at a case out of the state of Michigan, uh, Bay County, Michigan, where a couple is charged with breaking the law by having too much usable pot in their medical marijuana growing operation. The couple's name names are Sandra and David Dabrowski. Dabrowski, how cute. Uh, David, <laughs> Sandra and David Dabrowski, they're uh, 63 and 64, and the charges they're... Uh, facing are delivering or manufacturing marijuana. It's a four year felony if they're convicted on this. Now, it's important to understand that the couple are medical marijuana patients and caregivers. Um, they care for five others uh, as well as themselves. OK, so under the state's Medical Marijuana Act, and this is where we get to the the point is that these laws, these medical marijuana laws, oftentimes set people up to get busted. They almost, they almost incentivize getting busted. And what it is, is in the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, patients can have two and a half ounces of usable marijuana. And caregivers can grow up to 12 plants, producing two and a half ounces of usable marijuana for each of their five patients and themselves. And so if you didn't just stop and think, wait, what? Grow 12 plants that produce 2.5 ounces? Not 2.5 ounces per plant. 
2.5 ounces total. How small do your plants have to be? Let's see, two and a half ounces is what? 28, 56 and a half ounces, 14, 70 grams. All right, so we've got 70 grams that you're allowed to possess. <laughs> and uh, your 12 plants are supposed to produce 70 grams. All right, let's check some of this stuff out. 2.5 ounces in grams is, like I said, 70.8, almost 71 grams. And then 70 grams divided by 12 plants is 5.833 grams uh, in plant weight that are in usable weight that you're allowed to possess 5.833 grams in ounces works out to a, um, fifth of an ounce. <laughs> so each one of those plants you're growing, you better only grow them to harvest a fifth of an ounce off of each one. So here's the deal with those two being patients and caregivers for five others. They're legally allowed to have 132 plants, according to this uh, uh, piece. Let's see. 12 plants times 7 is actually not that. It would be 84. So where are they getting 132? I'm not sure. But according to the story, they're allowed to legally have a total of 132 plants and 27.5 ounces of usable marijuana. Let's see. 27.5 Divided by seven is not even accurate either. All right, 27.5 divided by 2.5 is 11. So they must be working this off of 11 plants, 11 patients somehow, because that's where the 132 comes up. I don't know why they're multiplying by 11. Regardless, the point is you're allowed to produce 12 plants, even if you're on your own here, if you're just caregiving for yourself, but you're only allowed to have 2.5 ounces of usable marijuana. And in the charges here, uh, it was they were found to have had, and this all came from tips and so forth, right? The officers found 96 marijuana plants. 96, not 132 that it, the story says they can have. And 37.7 grams of loose marijuana drying in a basket. Another batch on the table weighing approximately 1.4 kilograms. And then in the freezer, they found marijuana oil and several pounds of usable marijuana. And of course they did. You're producing 12 plants for how many patients each? They can't help but break the law. And this is the case in so many other states as well, where they set up, like here in Oregon, you can have four plants, but you can only have eight ounces, two ounces per plant. It's time to make these laws allow you to have the entire results of your harvest. <laughs> Now, the good news is, in the five states that are on deck for 2016, all of their laws allow you to have the results of your harvest. And Colorado's does as well. It's time to get rid of possession limits at home. There's an argument for possession limits in public. I get that, but not at home. We're back with Drug War Data Mines right after this. Get dot buzz. Dot buzz is the internet platform that fuels community interest, excitement, and new experiences. Dot buzz is the premier online destination for internet users seeking the latest news on a variety of topics. Dot buzz appeals to groups active in blogging, communications, journalism, advertising, and marketing. Dot buzz offers registrants a stronger alternative to the shrinking namespace of existing top-level domain names such as dot com, dot net, and dot org. Get your name now at get dot buzz. This is the Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com. MJWellness.com, the largest medical marijuana community in the world. Connect with thousands of patients, doctors, industry leaders, and businesses through shared personal experiences along our worldwide network. Discover new therapies and benefits with content tailored to you. Come grow your network on MJWellness.com. You're not alone. Your wellness matters. Learn, live, and thrive. Check out MJWellness.com today. Arguing for the end of adult marijuana prohibition is easy because we have facts, science, reason, compassion, evidence, truth, and logic on our side. 
It is even easier when researchers catalog it all for us. Learn how to gather the facts on marijuana use, arrests, seizures, rehabs, drug tests, and more in this edition of Drug War Data Mining. Welcome back, everyone. And today we're taking a look at data from the treatment episode data set. And uh, Tom Angel out at uh, marijuana.com has uh, recently put together a really good piece on this about uh, how most people who are in treatment for marijuana were referred by the criminal justice system. And uh, this is something that I've uh, brought up many times uh, over the past uh, few years when we've been discussing this issue. And... Uh, Wow, that's strange. <laughs> My speech didn't kind of, it's supposed to be coming up, but uh, let's try that again. But anyway, uh, this is something that I've pointed out for many years, uh, ever since I've been uh, going through the data. And according to the latest data uh, that Tom writes up, the treatment episode data set shows that nearly 52% of the people in drug treatment, primarily for marijuana, were referred by the criminal justice system. That is over half the people who end up in marijuana rehab are there because a court forced them to a drug court or a regular court forced them to among those referrals from criminal justice 44.1 percent were from probation or parole officers 16.2 percent were from courts and 2.2 percent from prisons and uh, this information is all available on uh, the treatment episode data set which you can actually download and the information runs from 2003 to 2013 and uh this is uh now the criticism of this that will come from the big rehab industry is that the uh data in ted's the treatment episode data set only is collected for those rehab agencies that get federal funding and so they have to, by law, report on some of this data. Private rehabs don't necessarily have to report. The last I was able to find out, TED's data reflected about 58% of the uh, rehabs out there compared to the other um, you know, 42% that might be private. But even with that, we'd have to assume that the private rehabs would have an incredibly different uh, admission rates for this to make any difference. Uh, and especially when most of the people that are, in, that are going to be sent there by the criminal justice system would end up in the publicly funded places because the state doesn't want to pay the money for the privately funded places. This information is all available, like I said, on the, uh, the TEDS website and um, marijuana.com. Tom Angel's piece on this will definitely give you the links that you need. As I covered this stuff before, I found a lot of this data as well. We find also that people uh, that end up in marijuana rehab, that first of all, admitting people to rehab, what do you think are the drugs that most likely send people to rehab? And this is uh, on the intake forms, whether it's a primary substance or a secondary substance. And in almost a third, of, more than a third of the cases, alcohol, 37%, is the reason for rehab, but the second most popular rehab drug is marijuana, 21%, over a fifth, over one out of five people being sent to rehab are being sent there for marijuana. And of the people that are being sent there for marijuana, they ask them how much marijuana have they been using in the past 30 days. 37% of the people sent to rehab for marijuana, over a third, say they've used none in the past month. Another 17% say they've used one to three times that month. So we have well over half the people going to rehab for marijuana who are using it less than once a week or not at all in the past month. Shows you how darn addictive it is. The referral sources are almost always from the uh, criminal justice, uh, the criminal justice system. And there's a couple different ways to look at this. I broke this down in 2008 and found for people who were cannabis only rehab admits, only go on to rehab for pot, it was 59% that were referred by the criminal justice system, only 13% sent themselves. But when you look at people who only went to rehab for drugs, not alcohol or cannabis, just drugs, 47% of them admit themselves compared to 23% who are sent there by the criminal justice system. 
In other words, for drugs, it's four times more likely you refer yourself to rehab than if you're using pot. And with pot, it's twice as likely that the criminal justice system sends you to rehab than if you were doing drugs. And most people will agree that it's the drugs we want people to go in to rehab for, the heroin, the cocaine, the methamphetamine. And when those beds are filled by someone who is merely a pot user who got caught, those serious drug addictions go untreated. And again, uh, looking at these data from 2011, it went down from 59% to about 53% referred to by the courts and criminal justice system. And according to uh, Tom's article, down to 52% in 2013, that to me says that the legalization of marijuana is taking away the power of sentencing clients to rehabs they do not need. If you need one reason why Big Rehab and their extension, Kevin Sabet, are fighting so hard against legalized marijuana, it's because they do not want to end the steady stream of easily rehabbed, forced clients that are sent to them by parole, probation, and drug courts. You also have to understand that as a rehab that gets public money, you need to show results. You need to show that you're actually helping people. What better way to boost your statistics than to have a whole bunch of potheads in your rehab who don't really need rehab and who can easily quit if you threaten them with a pee test. That's all that's left, folks. Big rehab and law enforcement. Those are our enemies. Not billionaires not other legalization initiatives and activists, rehab and law enforcement. All right, stay tuned. We'll be on the line with Doug Fine in our Hemp Day Hump Day update. Coming up next. This is the Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com. Herbie's Cannabis Seeds, we pride ourselves on bringing you the best quality seeds from the world's most respected cannabis seed producers, all at the lowest online prices. You can find Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. All cannabis seeds are sold as souvenirs and as a means of preserving cannabis genetics. Herbie's Seeds in no way intends to condone, promote, or incite the use of illegal or controlled substances. We strongly urge all prospective customers to check their national laws prior to placing an order. Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. Proud sponsors of The Russ Belville Show and 420 Radio. The Russ Belleville Show reminds you to never smoke and drive impaired. Hang out for a while and share. Great websites today need expert web design and development and need to be e-commerce ready and mobile friendly. But building a marketable and profitable website can be an uphill climb. Ready to make your new website or replace your existing website? Think Orange as the new way to get in the black. Orange Hill Development works with Fortune 500 companies and offer the same top quality development service at a fraction of what other providers charge. Brands like Absolute, Carlsberg, and Nestle trust Orange Hill Development. Find out why you should trust your website with Orange Hill. Contact Orange Hill for a consultation today at orangehilldevelopment.com. Marijuana legalization also ushers in the return of the American hemp industry. Get the latest news from the author of Hemp Bound and Too High to Fail, Doug Fine, in our Hemp Day Hump Day update. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Time for us to get our Hemp Day Hump Day update. We go to Doug Fine on the line. How you doing, Doug? Oh, goodness. Well, we don't have Doug Fine on the line. Well, let's see if we can find a little Doug Fine. Uh, he, he emailed me yesterday. He said he was ready for the segment. So let me see what I can find. Hemp Day, Hump Day, we're doing a segment. Yes, we are, Doug. Let's try calling Doug Fine one more time. We'll see if we can get him on the air. He is the author of Hemp Bound and Too High to Fail and uh, is tending to goats on his goat ranch. So we'll make sure that we can uh, give a shout out to the latest goats uh, out there. Doug's uh, website is DougFine.com. And he was telling me he just finished testifying at the Oregon Hemp Hearings. And uh, you sent a great picture of him amongst some large, large uh, hemp plants that have been uh, cultivated and are hanging and are drying. So 
Looks like he's been uh, very, very busy there in Colorado. Let's see. I'm probably. Yeah, we're unable to get a hold of Doug today. All right, we're going to take a break. And uh, when we come back, we'll have a radical rant. Kevin Sabet doesn't have a calling. He has a bigotry. Also, stay tuned for Hour 2 Toker Talk Radio. We'll take your calls at 971-533-7111. we got a story, uh, a good news story for once, coming out of New York relating to parental rights of cannabis users. Stay tuned. This is the Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com. You know Herb Thrasher from the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour. Now get ready for Herb Age Designs for the proud cannabis consumer. Herb Age Designs, lifestyle gear for the 420 friendly. Herb Age Designs, we've got frisbee golf discs and durable hemp gear. Herb Age Designs. We've got shot glasses, drinking glasses, coffee mugs, and beer cozies. Check us out on Facebook and online at HerbAgeDesigns.com. And follow Herb Age and Herb Thrasher on Twitter. We must continue to focus, to stick to the plan for 2016. Marijuana enforcement has been fundamental to the erosion of our constitutional rights. Replacing that with a legal system opens different questions. The pitch is that prohibition has only created, you know, crime, violence, and uh, the separation and destruction of families. It's time to end prohibition. California set the stage for marijuana legalization in America as the first state to legalize the drug for medical use with the passage of Prop 215 in 1996. But after the Golden State failed to legalize commercial marijuana sales in 2010, several states and the District of Columbia leapfrogged California and showed the nation what a recreational pot market would look like. But now, California is back in the game. Reason TV traveled to Oaksterdam University, the nation's premier cannabis cultivation school, where many of the political activists pushing an upcoming ballot initiative held a meeting to finalize language and debate some of the finer points of legalization. The group calls itself Reform CA and is chaired by Oaksterdam's president, Dale Sky Jones. We spoke to Sky Jones and several other activists about lessons learned from Prop 19, what other states can teach California, and what legalization in the largest state in the union would mean for the rest of the country. Coming off of the loss of Prop 19 in 2010, we realized that we had an awful lot of work to do to get it right for California in the coming years. Back in 2010, it was the first introduction of the idea of adult use of cannabis. So it was a, a you know testing the market, so to speak. I would never in favor of the 2010 effort because uh, the polls were too close and it was an off-year election. I campaigned against Prop 19. I thought Prop 19 was bad policy, I thought it was poorly thought out, and I thought it was too soon. Even though I'm a political consultant, uh, I understand that some issues need to fail before they win. And uh, I think to everyone's surprise with Proposition 19 is they expected it to come not even close. And instead, you know, it came in at 48%. It missed by, you know, three points. And if it wasn't for Proposition 19, there wouldn't have been the propositions that we saw in Colorado, Washington State, Washington DC, Alaska. So it was a precursor. Prop 19 may have paved the way for legalization in other states, but now legalization advocates believe California needs to learn some important lessons from Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and Washington DC. I think the most important thing that these states that have already chosen to regulate for adult consumption of cannabis offers is that there's proof the sky has not fallen. All of the scare tactics, the marijuana madness that has been put forth by those that would prefer to keep the failed status quo have been proven wrong. And at a certain point, we can hold people accountable to the lies that they've told. Washington State, Colorado, uh, they were very much interested in the tax revenues. The message is that it is going to be well regulated, well controlled, 
like alcohol, it only goes to adults. A few of the what not to do's that we've learned have specifically come from Washington State, not to beat up on one of the first because they did get it over the line, and that's important to note. The taxes that they initially envisioned were way too high. Colorado probably did it best overall in the way that they brought folks into a regulated system, a taxation system, and managed to keep intervention from the federal government away in the process. Colorado was also very burdensome, cumbersome, and expensive. And in fact, many of the things that folks tout as Colorado law with that seed to sale tracking and how stringent it is, isn't actually that stringent anymore because they realized it was ridiculously expensive. There is not a cop watching every plant out there. The day before this meeting took place, the state legislature for the first time passed uniform regulations that treat medical marijuana the same across the state. I wish that the ledge had passed this last year. I'm having flashbacks of 2010, the October surprise, when Schwarzenegger signed in a decriminalization measure saying, why legalize? We decriminalized. And I'm worried that we're gonna hear, why legalize? We finally just regulated medical. Let's wait till 2020. The Blue Ribbon Commission was first formed with Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom at the helm as chairman. I would say the Lieutenant Governor himself is an excellent qualifier for how far we've come. He was against Prop 19 at the time, and he is now heading up this commission. The commission generated a giant report full of recommendations. I would say the single most important issue that I would recommend is that there be rigorous collection of data. With legalization, we have to have information about the consumption of marijuana, public health issues, public safety issues, taxation, regulatory data. All of that information can help us make reasoned judgments on public policy that are based on fact. Reform CA published its initiative in early October. A lot can happen over the next year, including the possibility of competing initiatives. But these activists remain optimistic and believe that legalization in California could be a tipping point in the war on marijuana. Some people say there are six Californias, some people say there are 10 Californias. As we proceed, we're gonna to have to basically address the concerns of each of these Californias and show that overall, it's a good to have a statewide system. California has more producers than the rest of the country combined. We produce more cannabis and, you know, a little bit of uh, pride here, we produce the best cannabis. There's been a groundswell statewide of growers and small businesses waking up to the fact that we can't hide from regulation forever. The best possible outcomes will come by embracing it and helping to shape it and guide it. I thought that when California legalized medical marijuana, the federal government would deschedule it or something like that. And lo and behold, I was mistaken in that. The federal government really has not changed federal laws an iota in, in, in these 20 years. Nonetheless, I do think that the handwriting is on the wall now and we have majority votes even in Congress to let the states follow their own laws in this regard. California represents one-sixth of the U.S. economy. So goes California, so goes the rest of the nation, and likely the rest of the world. Everyone is watching. And if we don't get this right, we become the redheaded stepchildren poster child of what not to do. And we're done being that for the last few years. And some audio from Reason TV there that uh, was a discussion mostly there with Dale Sky Jones. You just heard her voice. And uh, you also heard Dale Geringer in that piece, the head of California Normal. And uh, now we have seen that, yes, indeed, lots of things happened in the interim. Uh, Reform California is no more. The majority of its board have voted to withdraw its initiative from consideration. And most of them now have jumped to support the so-called Sean Parker initiative, the adult use of marijuana initiative. So indeed, many things did change. But there are still other competing initiatives out there, the Marijuana Control Legalization and Revenue Act and the California Cannabis Hemp Initiative, the so-called Jack Herrer Initiative. But neither one of them promised to have any sort of funding even approaching what Sean Parker and the other billionaires lined up with him, the Pritzker family, uh, the couple of the Pritzker family heirs, the hotel chain heirs from Hyatt, uh, they will most likely be the initiative that will get the, to the ballot in 2016. The Russ Belleville Show.
Chat is for friends 18 and older. We expect our chat to be civil, mature, and free from excessive profanity. If you don't like these rules, there are approximately 6 billion other chat rooms with lower standards that you can visit. Dr. Dabber, hurry! Its temperature is shooting past 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's burning up! I'm afraid for this little guy, it's just too late. What caused the problem? Only Dr. Dabber can maintain the perfect temperature for a smooth-tasting, slower burn. This standard vaporizer lost all of its health benefits, sending it up in smoke. So you're telling me that most vapor pens burn so hot they produce smoke, not vapor? Correct! Keep away from those standard vaporizer pens and turn to Dr. Dabber, doctor's order. Less heat, <laughs> More flavor. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. That marijuana, pot, grass, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most dangerous drug. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make them. I experimented with marijuana a time or two, and I didn't like it and didn't inhale. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. Entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Radical Rant. In today's Radical Rant, we get to take a look at my favorite subject of ranting, the Joker to my Batman, Kevin Sabet, who was profiled by Joel Warner in the International Business Times today. With a feature article, long, long article entitled, Kevin Sabet is the marijuana movement's biggest threat, but can he really stop Big Pot? And it inspired me. There's a whole lot to read in the article, and uh, you can you can find it on International Business Times. Uh, just Google Kevin Sabet. It'll appear in the news feed. And my favorite part of the story is this quote from Kevin himself. He says, I want there to be a thousand Kevins. There can't be just one Kevin. Kevin is not going to be able to do this alone. Kevin can't just do this year after year. He is going to have heart, he is going to have a heart attack. <laughs> wow, Kevin, when you start talking about yourself in the third person, your grip on reality is starting to slip. Kevin laments that he can't find any fellow anti-pot warriors to take up his crusade. Part of the problem, of course, is that three in five people want legal marijuana and four in five people want legal medical marijuana. Only one in 14 people believe the war on drugs is successful and only one in seven support any continued jailing of people for marijuana. Four in nine people have tried marijuana and one in nine people currently use marijuana. Three out of four people believe marijuana will eventually be legal to buy and use nationwide. So yes, it might be tough to find some recruits to your cause. The IBT piece is thorough, and it includes some criticisms from Tom Angel and Brian Vincente. It asks questions about Project Sam's funding, which Sabet claims runs at about $100,000 per year. <laughs> yeah, right. Kevin also admits they've gotten some new funding that's allowed him to hire on two assistants. Well, I highly doubt that all of this factors in the flights, hotels, rental cars, and per diem that have Kevin dashing to, as the piece notes, London, Dublin, Melbourne, New York, and Washington. The piece even questions Kevin's lack of an alternative policy to ending marijuana prohibition and points out, you know, with the criticisms that everybody said, he keeps saying he wants this new third way that is neither locking up pot smokers, nor commercial legalization. But he never mentions what those policies will be, never floats any policies. But I can tell you what they would be, because it's right there on the Project Sam website. They say, possession or use of a small amount of marijuana should be a civil offense subject to a mandatory health screening and marijuana education program, including being monitored for 6 to 12 months in a probation program designed to prevent further drug use. In other words, tickets, fines, and coerced rehab backed by urine tests. And what if I say no to all of those? I suppose it's still jail time, right, Kevin? See, Kevin's white whale these days is the specter of commercialized marijuana. 
With respect to that, the policies that are endorsed by Project SAM on their website say, quote, production, distribution, dealing, and sale of marijuana should remain misdemeanors or felonies, end quote. Yes, they would end mandatory minimums. Yes, they would provide drug treatment in prison. Yes, they would restore your civil rights upon release. But if you grow or sell marijuana, Project Sam and Kevin Sabet want you in prison. Project Sam, as I tell you, never puts forth an actual initiative or policy proposal, and Kevin himself notes that in the piece. He says, quote, We have to go on the offense. I am sick of saying vote no, vote no. We want to be yes, end quote. But how do you get in America where three out of five support commercial legalization to vote for what is essentially possession decrim with mandatory rehab and a continuation of imprisoning growers and dealers? This is just his latest shift in his rhetoric as American attitudes have shifted on marijuana. In the beginning, he was stridently anti-medical marijuana. In 2012, he claimed California had buyer's remorse from medical marijuana. He cheered as Los Angeles shut down dispensaries that were, quote, selling marijuana for so-called scare quotes medical purposes, end quote. He called medical marijuana, quote, a sad joke, end quote. But fast forward three years and three Sanjay Gupta weed specials later, and Kevin is telling the International Business Times that, quote, components of marijuana might hold medical promise, end quote. But for Kevin, medical marijuana means big pharma dispensing those components as non-smoked pills, liquids, or inhalers at great profit, rather than people growing a medicinal herb to treat themselves cheaply. While he promotes Big Pharma, lately Kevin claims to be fighting Big Tobacco 2.0. This is the concept of marijuana industries becoming corporate giants that will, quote, try to hook potential customers when they're young, hence the growing ubiquity of marijuana-infused gummy bears and other candies, end quote. As if adults don't like gummy bears and candy. In fact, adults do. According to Simmons Market Research Bureau, quote, 75% of adults regularly buy or eat candy. And, quote, as the population ages, much of the future growth in candy consumption is projected to occur among adults, end quote. The article even lead, lends some credence to Kevin Sabet's concerns by repeating the Sabet conjecture. Quote, and this is the IB Time, I, uh, International Business Times writing, not Kevin Sabet, but the Times writer says, quote, Our country has already allowed the mass commercialization of two intoxicating substances, alcohol and tobacco, which together cause more than 500,000 U.S. deaths and $500 billion in social costs each year. Do we want to follow the same path for marijuana? End quote. Well, shame on the writer for not pointing out that unlike alcohol and tobacco, marijuana is neither toxic nor addictive to the point of serious physical withdrawal. The Sabbat conjecture is this idea that for every $1 in taxes alcohol and tobacco bring in, there is $10 in resulting social costs, so we can't bank on tax revenues for legal marijuana. Well, why isn't the writer asking, now that Colorado and Washington have reaped $200 million in marijuana tax revenue, where's the corresponding $2 billion in marijuana's social costs? What Kevin Sabet is really proposing is ensuring that cannabis consumers are still marginalized, discriminated against, kept out of sight, and punished if they're caught. Punish users and dealers and growers just a little less. I call it the kinder, gentler drug war model. And I punctured this kinder, gentler drug war shtick last year in La Grande, Oregon. I was following Kevin Sabet as he toured the state trying to convince people to vote against our legalization plan. And I asked him 
if you oppose commercialization of marijuana and you oppose locking up marijuana smokers, do you support Washington, D.C.'s initiative? It's grow and give. There's no commercialization whatsoever. Nope, Kevin responded, because D.C. is just trying to lay the groundwork for commercialization later. <laughs> okay, I replied. So a system with no shops and no advertising that only allows people to grow personally and share can't be approved because someday it might become commercial? Well, he nodded. He was getting kind of annoyed with me. And so I continued. So what about other non-commercial systems like the Spanish collective model or the Amsterdam coffee shop model or the state-run liquor store model where, where there isn't a big marijuana, where there isn't a corporatized industry? Nope, nope, he couldn't support any of those either because Kevin will not support a marijuana policy that recognizes adult use free from government intervention. Now, this all happened because Kevin was touring Oregon trying to defeat our legalization measure, which won by the greatest margin of the four legal states. So thanks, Kevin. He was able to tour through Oregon because of money that had been appropriated by county drug prevention groups through their grants of federal money that is only supposed to be used for education, not electioneering. Now, Kevin thought he could get away with that because his anti-pot vote education tour had been done in 2012 as well, and nobody called him on it. In 2014, however, myself and other advocates, backed by Representative Earl Blumenauer's office, questioned the propriety and legality of using government money to campaign against our marijuana legalization initiative. And we prevailed, because Oregon law is very strict about anti-electioneering. Kevin tried to sell his 13 Oregon tour stops as merely informational and not intended to oppose our legalization measure. But guidance from the Oregon Attorney General reminded him that, quote, if the information presented to the public clearly favors or opposes the measure, it doesn't have to explicitly say vote no on 91 to be considered anti-measure 91 electioneering. Then, in doing the open records requests to determine just how these counties were misspending their federal grant money, I learned that Kevin earns a $3,000 appearance fee from each of the tour stops. In addition to having his flight, rental car, hotels, and per diem covered. When six of the 13 tour stops canceled for fear of investigation into their misuse of funds, I discovered that some county district attorneys were using their offices, phones, email, and work time to solicit donations to cover Kevin's appearances from other district attorneys and county sheriffs who were also at, the, at work at the time, on your dime. Folks, Kevin Sabet is nothing more than the musicians stoically playing on deck as the Titanic of marijuana prohibition sinks. As the failed Oregon tour proved, the only people supporting Kevin's mission now are big rehab and law enforcement, which together provided 92% of all the funding against Oregon's legalization and all of the money to bring Kevin Sabet to speak to mostly empty halls filled only with fellow rehabbers and law enforcement. It's an amazing article, International Business Times, ibtimes.com, Kevin Sabet is the marijuana movement's biggest threat, but can he really stop big pot? And he is, uh, one of the other things about this article uh, is very interesting, is the recent developments of the, uh, the, the blowback against this so-called big pot, even within our movement. The rejection of the Ohio Monopoly Initiative model and now where we have uh, Dan Riffle of Marijuana Policy Project leaving MPP complaining about the basically industry takeover of the Marijuana Policy Project and how they're going to move forward on their initiatives. So this is a dynamic. And Sam Kamen from the University of Denver, he's a marijuana law professor, says, quote, 
There's a real tipping point here. It's whether the industry runs this going forward or the policy wonks do. There's real room for Sabet and others to say, let's keep this from being alcohol and tobacco. So it is getting some uh, play here. And, and this latest, you know, the Sean Parker initiative where billionaires are now getting involved and moving this. Uh, we heard from it from Ethan Nadelman at the International Drug Policy Alliance Conference talking about the growing influence of the industry in moving these uh, initiatives forward rather than the activism. Uh, we see that with the Reform California group, which is the, primarily the activist group, uh, dropping their initiative and getting behind the industry-led uh, Adult Use of Marijuana Act. Of course, uh, Kevin Sabet's also got two assistants now. Uh, their names are Jeff Zinsmeister. He's a former State Department narcotics officer. And the other is Will Jones. Will Jones was the young man. He's 24. And uh, he launched... The two is enough campaign to try to stop Washington, D.C. legalization in 2014. Uh, of course, Washington, D.C. legalization passed with 70 percent of the vote. But uh, this Will Jones is right in Kevin Sabet's mold. The International Business Times uh, article points out how he formed the students for a drug free Berkeley uh, as an undergraduate and uh, has been uh, always fight, you know, even from age 17 on been one of these anti-drug wonderkins. Will Jones is another one along that same line. All right, folks, that's all the time we got for hour one. Thanks to all of you watching on the webcam on Ustream. We're going to close that down as we get into hour two. Toker Talk Radio, where the phone lines are open at 971-533-7111. You can call in. We'll talk about big marijuana. Are you afraid of big marijuana? The corporate takeover of the marijuana movement is it a good thing is it a bad thing or does it really matter plus we'll look at that story that good news story out of new york regarding child custody and marijuana for everyone here at cannabisradio.com and roller j studios in beautiful legal potland oregon i'm radical russ until next time take care of each other tokers This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey.